Okay. So hi everyone. Um, like Walter said, my name is Chris Cogswell. I have a PhD in chemical engineering. Um, I am a customer and engineering global consultant here at Elsevier. And today we thought it'd be kind of a good use of uh, a good use of one of these webinar sessions to kind of talk about new graduate student boot camp and going over what it's like to be a new grad student. What are some of the tricks, uh, tips and tricks, and you know other things that you should probably know before you get into grad school. So um, just for people on the call here to kind of know who's talking to you. Um, like I said, my name is Chris. I initially got my bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and philosophy from the University of New Hampshire, um, and then actually got a PhD in chemical engineering from Northeastern University. And I know that when I was making the transition to grad school, it was pretty daunting. It was scary, um, you know, moving to a new city, not really knowing anybody, leaving the comfort and kind of closeness of your undergraduate school um, and the community that that's in. It can be a big change. And there were a lot of questions I had that I really didn't know about um, and things that I really wish that I had learned or been told before I started grad school. So that was kind of the idea here behind this session. So, OK, you've gotten into grad school. Well, now what? Um, and for a lot of you, I'm sure you're thinking, great, more school, uh, just what I want to do, right? Um, grad school really is a very exciting time in your life. And really, it's one of the times that now when I'm, you know, now that I've, I'm working and I'm older and everything else, I think back to grad school and really miss it, actually, which seems, um, which sounds kind of strange, because I think a lot of people when they leave grad school are just so happy to be done with it. But, you know, really, Grad school is the first time in your life that you're going to be being paid, um, well, hopefully you'll be being paid, to do research, to investigate something that no one has ever investigated before, um, to find new things and really add to the body of knowledge that's out there. But before you get to do that, your first step really should be getting comfortable with your new surroundings, right? And so with some important things that you might not be thinking about are going to be things like what is the best reading or writing spot on campus that isn't your lab, right? Um, for me, it was outside of the Mugar uh, building, which is where my lab was located at Northeastern. So that's a nice picture of that here. Um, where is good parking? Where's late night parking, right? There are nights that you're going to probably be in your lab late or studying or getting ready. You need to have a place where you can either transport there on public transport or actually find a place to put your car so you're not getting towed. Um, where's the best cheap food on campus? Where can you get late night coffee? And most importantly, where is the best bar on campus or near campus that isn't full of undergrads, right? You need a place to decompress. Um, so you have to find those places. So speaking to grad students and getting involved in those kind of student groups um, can be really useful and really helpful. So all right, what does your grad school timeline look like? And I call this the fourth year dream because everyone thinks when they get into grad school, I'm gonna be done in my fourth year. Um, that doesn't usually happen. I know my PhD took five years and um, that was even with some real pushing on my advisor and department to let me leave. Um, this is an image from um, University of uh, British Columbia uh, that talks about you know what your structure generally is. So in your first two years, you're gonna be doing coursework. And while you're doing coursework, you're going to be doing um, applying for funds or awards to get funding to do your work. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, you're going to have to form your supervisory committee or what's known as your PhD committee. These are going to be the professors or figures who advise you day to day, right, or sometimes day to day, depending on how close they are to you, but also determining if you pass your qualifying exam and ultimately if you pass your doctoral defense and can become a doctor uh, or a PhD in your field. Um, at this time period, you might also be picking your advisor, which uh, depends on the school, of course, and we'll talk a little bit more about that too, but really that can kind of depend. Usually towards the beginning or middle of your second year, um, you'll be completing your coursework and then you're gonna be going into what are known as your comprehensive exams or your qualifying exams. And that then is usually followed very quickly by your thesis proposal. Now, at that point in your schooling, you've probably already found an advisor. You've likely already picked your supervisory committee, your PhD committee. Um, and you're gonna have to take essentially an exam to determine whether or not you can continue in the program. 
And usually that exam and then the thesis proposal um, involves a little bit of research work, but some doesn't have to, sometimes it can, sometimes it won't. But usually that's the point in the, in the PhD process where students will leave, right? So if you don't pass qualifying exams or something happens or whatever, um, usually that's the point in time where people will either leave with a master's degree or uh, may just decide to go into industry generally. After you've passed your qualifying exam, you are what's known as a doctoral candidate. Um, and pre that you're a, you're a, what is it, a PhD candidate, and then you're an actual doctoral student, I guess I should say. Um, so you're a candidate pre-qual and then you're a your actual candidate afterwards. And at that point, then you're gonna be doing research work, writing papers, going into the lab every day, um, really doing the hard work of that. And then eventually at some point there, you're gonna start writing your dissertation. And of course, this looks like a very close thing here because this is saying you're going to be finished at the end of year four. And that is not going to happen <laughs> for most people, right? There's no way you're going to be done at year four. For most people, you do at least two to three years of research work before you start writing your thesis. But there are some smart ways that you can kind of shrink that time down. Um, for example, working on your thesis or writing your papers as if they're going to be part of your thesis. But we're going to talk about that a little bit more here in a moment. So the first thing you need to do is find an advisor and a research project. Um, and there's really sort of two really important things you need to think about here. The first one is, what kind of advisor do you want? Do you want somebody who's very, very on top of you, who will be checking in on you every single day, looking at the data you do, and really managing your day-to-day -day work? Or do you want someone who's a little bit more hands-off? Another thing to think about, of course, is funding, right? Is the project you're working on funding? So. Picking your advisor is gonna end up being probably the most important decision you'll make as a grad student. Um, changing advisors is very rare. It can be really hard. And generally, if you're changing advisors, you're not staying in the same school. You might be moving to another university. So picking that initial advisor can be really important. Um, some of the things you should consider, right, are do you have compatible personalities? Do their grad students seem happy? If you walk into their lab and their grad students seem miserable, um, that's probably not a great sign, right? You need to talk to them and see, well, what's the problem? What's making you not feel so good? What are the challenges you're having? Um, do you like the day-to-day -day laboratory work that this field is going to be doing, right? Or these people are doing every day? Um, you know, if you don't like pipetting things constantly, you probably don't want to work in a lab that's doing work with uh, cells, for example, right? Maybe you'd be better off in a lab doing catalysis work or adsorption or something. Um, does the advisor have funding? Are they a new professor or do they have tenure? That usually, it doesn't seem like such a big difference, but it can be really important, right? A professor with tenure who's been there for a long time already has connections to other professors and advisors. Um, usually they're gonna be a better fit for you if you wanna go off into academia. Um, whereas a new professor is gonna be a little bit more hands-on, maybe a little bit more um, ready to take risks and changes and things like that. But there's a risk that that professor may not have the kind of connections you need to continue an academic career. And then of course, what, are, what have their graduate students actually gone on to do? Have they gone to industry? Have they gone to academia? Have they started working for companies that you like that maybe you want to apply to? The most important part of this, though, ultimately, is you don't want to pick a good school if the advisor isn't somebody you can work with, right? Um, the name on the degree is less important generally than the output of work that you do, right? If you leave a mid-level university with 10, um, 10 papers all with over 20 citations, you're gonna be a much stronger candidate for jobs and academia than if you go to a wonderful school, top tier school, and you don't publish anything. And the final thing too to really consider here is what is graduation like? Um, I love this comic. PhD comics is the perfect encapsulation of what grad school is like. Um, and this one is, is so true here, right? When there's plenty of funding, your advisor isn't gonna want you to leave. But when you have no funding, you might suddenly be given a deadline to say, you need to get out of here, right? Or otherwise we can't pay you. So how do you get funding, right? And what does funding actually mean? So um, 
Funding for a graduate program, it really depends on the type of program you work for, what school you go to and all those other things. Some programs are gonna be fully funded when you apply, right? So for example, that was the case I was very fortunate and lucky to um, basically be given um, a full uh, ride in graduate school for chemical engineering. And that was paid for through teaching assistantships and research assistantships. Teaching assistantship means that you're gonna be help, helping to teach a course. So you'll actually be working with a professor to teach a course. Um, you might be grading papers. You might be actually doing the uh, teaching work yourself. You might actually be teaching lectures. Um, research assistantship generally means you are helping to do research on a project that is funded through some other organization. When you're looking at your funding package, you wanna look at things like your tuition coverage, right? Does it actually pay for your coursework? Um, is there a stipend, right? If it just pays for your coursework and there's no stipend, you're probably going to start, you're going to need money to live, right? How do you get food and housing and everything else? Um, generally, these programs will have something in there about health, dental, and vision insurance. Usually, it's the same as the professors. It can be generally okay, but you might still need supplemental insurance. kind of depends. Other benefits you may not realize you're getting to that you're paying for um, might be a book or supplies stipend or discounts. Um, you might be paying for a parking spot or access to a parking area. You might be paying for access to the campus gym or sports complexes. Definitely make use of those. You are paying for them. And of course, the library that's on campus. The library is going to be one of the most important buildings in your life as a PhD student. So we'll talk about that a little bit more here, too. Um, now, in general, some things that are often thought of, uh, or some things that are often kind of miss, um, a little bit of misnomers, I guess, out there in the field. In general, master's degrees are not funded through scholarships. You're going to need to find funding of your own. That being said, if you begin as a PhD student um, and then decide to leave with a master's degree, usually that is considered okay. It kind of depends though, right? You don't want to apply to a school just to think I'm going to get funding here as a PhD and then leave as a master's. That's not, you know, you don't want to take away funding from someone else who's going to be there for a long time, but that can happen. And usually they don't require you to pay it back or anything. Um, and again, PhD programs in certain fields are more likely to be funded through scholarship or through these TA or RA ships than others. Um, but again, sometimes the research work you end up doing in that field will be the same. So, you know, a good example of this is cancer research. If you want to do cancer research, you can apply to it as a biological or a biology student as a student working in, say, genetics or genetic engineering, biological engineering, chemical engineering, etc. There's a bunch of different fields. But your chances of being funded as a biological or chemical engineer are greater than your chances of being funded, let's say, as a biology student. Um, so you want to take a look at that, too, and be kind of a little bit strategic. Um, the other thing, too, is you want to check with the school before you apply. Is funding provided to students through the department or is it through the advisor? What do I mean by that? If it's provided by the advisor, then that means that when you apply to a school, you want to specify the advisor you want to work with, and you want to try to get that advisor to agree to take you into their lab. But if it's applied through the school or the department, you have a little bit more freedom in picking your advisor, right? You don't really have to worry about that as much, but you still, you still need to worry about it a little bit. So how do you get funding on your own? Um, in some programs, of course, you're going to need to find funding on your own. And generally, they will post things like, well, teaching or research roles that you can apply to. They'll have scholarships or grants that you can apply for. Um, and again, a lot of the times, those grants will come with other benefits, right? Stuff like money for living expenses or stipends, um, access to special programs or services. If you apply, say, for a NASA grant, you usually will also be allowed to work with NASA engineers or have some part in a program like that, access to another facility someplace. Um, and also name recognition and prestige, right? If you become a Ford Fellow, a Fulbright Scholar, if you become um, someone who gets the GRFP, the Graduate Research Fellowship Program through NSF, those are very competitive um, and very prestigious grants and awards. So if you get those, generally, you are going to be seen as a much stronger candidate for later, say, academic uh, positions. Usually these grants, just like journals, will have strict deadlines for applications and requirements. And your program, most programs at least, will require you to apply to the GRFP in your first and second year, even if you have funding. The idea behind applying to the GRFP in your first and second year 
Um, it's only available to first and second year students. It's actually available before you go to grad school too. You can apply for it as a senior, but you can only apply twice. So it is important that you apply. Um, you can apply, like I said, as a senior, but you're not going to have as much um, support, let's say, um, to, to apply and everything else. You'll be working on your senior courses, but it can be a good idea, if you, especially if you know that you're going into a field where funding might be a challenge, applying for the GRFP as a senior. If you get it, you can basically go to any school, right? There, no one's going to turn you down if you already have funding. And here we have some other resources, too, that you can check out um, later on if you'd like. All right, so let's say you get funding, everything's going great, all that stuff. Now you have your qualifying exam. Um, what is the qualifying exam? So usually that's sometime in your second year and you're gonna need to undergo it. What does it mean will vary depending on the program you go to. But in all cases, you need to pick your committee. That committee is gonna be three to five experts in your field who are going to judge your candidacy and your research plan. Now, how is it actually judged? Generally, the qualifying exam will include a couple of different parts. There's going to be a written exam, and that's going to either be in the form of a test you actually have to take, or it's going to be through coursework uh, with a required GPA. Right? So, for example, um, in my school, the, the required GPA was a 3.5 or above to be considered that you've passed your um, coursework or written qualifying exam requirement. You're going to have to write a thesis or a written candidacy, kind of like a proto or pre-dissertation. Um, usually there's a requirement for page length and everything else. Generally, what I've seen is around 50 pages long, um, but it can vary. And then you have to, that, that candidacy kind of pre-dissertation report is going to be given to your, your committee to read and understand and, and give comments and everything else. And then you need to do a presentation of your research plan. That presentation is going to generally be 45 minutes or more. Um, it doesn't have to include lab work usually. Again, depends on the field. But at this point, you might not have even picked an advisor yet, right? You're still maybe just a candidate and not actually working in a lab. Um, it is generally presented to your department and the public, but really you're aiming it at your committee, right? You want them to agree that you're ready to continue doing work. There are a few possible outcomes of the qualifying exam. You can pass, which that's obviously the best one. And passing means you've become a doctoral candidate. You continue research, you're, you're all good. You can have a conditional pass, which means that you've passed with some changes to the plan or the thesis, or maybe an improvement of your grade. You can fail. Now, fail sounds terrible, but a fail usually just means it requires major revisions of your plan or coursework, but you are allowed to re-exam. Um, what this means then is essentially, your current plan isn't good enough or your coursework hasn't been good enough. Let's go through some revisions here and, and you will redo this essentially. Um, generally, there's a requirement for that to be done in a certain time period, usually like a semester or maybe a year. Um, and sometimes the option is given to students, like I said before, to leave with a master's degree if you don't pass that qualifying um, exam requirement. Um, and then the worst case is a unanimous fail. And basically what that means is your committee has decided you will fail with no re-examination. That's rare. Um, generally, it, it really has to be, um, you really have to have not put in the work or there has to be a really egregious error going on. Um, but generally, um, the first three are what you're going to see. So what does your dissertation actually contain? Um, generally, there are different sections to it. You're going to have an abstract. Right, and the abstract is going to be really a standalone summary of the major background, methodology, findings of your work. Um, it can include a visual abstract component as well. An introduction, which is a discussion of the reason you're doing your project, right? What problem are you trying to solve? A literature review, that's going to be your longest and most challenging section by far. It is a summary of the literature you're building on for your project. And we're going to talk a little bit here about what tools you can use to try to do that literature review better. Um, a methodology section that talks about the tools, techniques, and lab work you'll be doing. Analysis of the data, right? So talking about how will I analyze the data? What am I looking for? A results section, which is a discussion and showcase of your results and what they suggest to you. And then a conclusion section, right? So what do you feel your work proves? What answer have you given? Um, what are some future studies to look into? Things like that.
Now, one thing to notice here too, there are some other sections, but um, one thing you want to notice is that these sections really mirror what you supply for a journal publication. So a smart thing you can do is as you're writing journal articles, as you're writing papers to try to submit, um, keep in mind, this is one day going to go into my dissertation. So if you write it in a way that it can kind of be, you know, copied and pasted or edited a little bit to fit a dissertation, that is a really smart way to do things. Um, it'll save you a lot of time. It'll save you a lot of hassle. And really, it's going to be uh, generally the standards that are required for journals are not going to be so dissimilar to what's required for your thesis. So you'll be able to kind of do the two things together. Um, you know, when I was writing my dissertation, two things that really helped me were coffee, of course, but also going on nature walks. I actually ended up writing the bulk of my dissertation um, at a family home um, my wife has up in the mountains of New Hampshire. Um, getting away from lab work and actually writing can be really helpful, although sometimes you will not have that. Um, you may not have that luxury. Now, for a lot of you, you're probably terrified. How am I ever going to be able to write 50 pages to 100 pages of work? And the answer here is you're going to practice. Right? You're going to write stuff all the time. You're going to be doing presentations to your advisor and your lab group every week, probably. You're going to be and, and abstracts for conferences and everything else. Don't be daunted by the writing part. Um, if you practice as you keep getting good at it, you are going to find yourself eventually a very capable technical writer. Now, that being said, there are some really important tools of the trade that you're going to want to get familiar with, right? So some tools that I made use of um, a lot when I was in school, Mendeley. Mendeley is a wonderful tool. It allows you to kind of put your resources or your references together. It's going to save you so much time and hassle putting together your references. Um, it's just a wonderful tool. Novel, which is available through Elsevier Engineering um, and Engineering Village. Novel is going to be helpful in preparing for your qualifying exam, right? So um, I might need to learn a little bit more about fluid mechanics. I can go into Novel and search for fluid mechanics and actually find that content, right? Um, so for example here, let's just take a little tour quickly um, just to show you what I mean. So here I'll just go right over to novel.com. And let's say, for example, I'm interested in, again, fluid mechanics, right? So maybe I need a little bit more knowledge here on, so let me log in quickly. So for example here, perhaps I need more help on, say, the Navier-Stokes equation, right? So I'll look for Navier-Stokes, pop it open. And there is a huge amount of content here for me to go through. All right, so here, maybe I want to look at the unsteady Stokes and Navier Stokes equations. I need to prepare for my exam here. And I can go and actually read through this content that's available on Novel. All right, and so here we go. So Novel is going to give you access to a huge amount of content um, that maybe is not available in your library, maybe not available readily to you. It's available at home. It's just going to be a great tool for you as you're getting into grad school. Even learning about methods and things, right? How does an XRD work? How does FTIR work? Those sorts of things are going to be very valuable here. Um, the other tool I mentioned is Engineering Village. Now, Engineering Village is going to be very valuable in doing your literature review. So what do I actually mean by that? So here, for example, um, if I run this search, let's say, here for solar panels, maybe that's the kind of work that I'm doing. Right, So maybe I know that I need to do a literature review on solar panel applications because the chemical I'm working on is being used for solar panels. What I can do here is run this search and then down here, I can start looking and say, okay, well, I wanna limit this to the last couple of years. First off, I'll limit it there. And now I wanna see who are the top authors. All right, so there we go, we have those names. What are their top affiliations? What is the controlled vocabulary they're working in? Right, these are the terms I need to know if I'm gonna be doing graduate level work in this field. Right, so here I can see, right, the most important terms here, so solar power generation, of course, I looked for solar panels, but as I get down here, maximum PowerPoint trackers, 
electric power transition networks, DC-DC converters, right? Solar radiation. These are topics I need to know about, clearly, right? Because this is the kind of stuff that's going on. This is the research that's really happening. So I can use this tool to do a quick literature review to see, am I on point? Am I getting this right? And as I go through here, maybe I want to look at energy utilization. I can click on this, and then I can actually see here, what are these topics? What are these papers here? And as I can see here too, I can see which papers. This one here, cited in Scopus 48 times. This is going to be an important paper for me to read. All right, it's highly cited. I want to take a look at this. Okay. Some of the other tools that are gonna be important here, Scopus, like I just mentioned, Scopus is gonna allow you to see what the H index is, how many citations a paper has, all of which is very important for you as a grad student. Um, you wanna be looking at most, at, at very well-cited papers. Of course, your department staff, right? The people who are gonna be helping you, make sure you get stuff in on time, the deadlines, who know all the ins and outs of the department, that team in your department staff headquarters, are so important. Get to know them, please. They are going to help you so, so much. And of course, your campus library, right? Um, you are paying for the resources in that library. Make use of it. Even if you only just go there to study, um, you know, use the space, talk to the librarians. They are so knowledgeable and capable, um, and they're going to be able to help you. And so with that, really, I want to thank you for your time and attention here today. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and Walter, I pass it back over to you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, I know I learned a lot. Hopefully everybody got some value. Um, one of the things that they, they were asking is if you could give that link to the funding uh, that you shared on the PowerPoint, if you could put that in the chat. And then another question that I'm seeing here, um, somebody's asking, what is different with novel? Um, so, so any... Um, <laughs> So can you kind of give a little bit more context? Yeah. There? So <laughs> I was going to ask them uh, to expand on that question. Um, and in the meantime, while we have more questions coming in, is we're going to launch the second poll. So let me okay. go ahead and launch that. People could Actually, answer that before. Let me throw that link into the chat here for everybody. Perfect. And then another so the question. Thing, sorry, go ahead. Another question that I'm seeing here is how long does a dissertation uh, usually take? So a uh, dissertation usually will take um, anywhere from, well, it kind of depends, right? So usually the dissertation will take at least a year to write, mm -hmm. um, usually a little bit more. It can really depend though. Um, I think my dissertation took from the time I started writing it to the end, um, really started writing it. I think it took about a year and a half and in that time too, you're trying to finalize papers, write publications, things like that. So it can really um, it can really depend. But yeah, usually at least a year it'll take to write your dissertation. At least a year. Perfect. Well, it looks like we're about to run out of time. Let me end the poll over here. Um, they did not expand on that question. What I did want to point out with Novel is it's completely interactive. So you have a lot of tools and a lot of equations that are available to you that you can kind of work with and really uh, plug and play in, you know, like other products. Um, and then before we leave, I just want to invite everybody to our next webinar series. So sneak peek into the life of a drone engineer. It's going to be exciting. So if you're going to be able to go, it's going to be in two weeks from today, August the 26th. So with that, um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, you can watch this video and many others that we've done on our YouTube channel, as you can see up here, and just go ahead and go to YouTube, Elsevier Engineering, and you'll find us there. So thank you all for joining us and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye.